Le Sommet international de l'éducation du futur réunit une soixantaine de conférenciers du monde entier. Des pionniers et des innovateurs issus du monde de l'éducation, bien évidemment, mais également des êtres inspirants, issus des chemins de sagesse ou des chemins d'apprentissage et de créativité dans différents domaines. Les arts, les sciences, l'économie, le lien avec la nature, le sport, etc. Des expériences et des chemins de vie qui sont un formidable enrichissement pour le monde de l'éducation. Le professionnalisme des traductions, en simultané, et l'incroyable richesse de toutes ces conférences offre un horizon de point de vue vaste et varié, très complet, qui en font au final une véritable formation professionnelle pour les enseignants, les éducateurs et tous les professionnels de l'éducation, mais également une formation à la parentalité consciente et une formation individuelle à la vie consciente. Face à toute cette richesse et aux divers retours, nous avons décidé d'offrir toutes ces conférences à tous, partout dans le monde en français et en anglais, quelquefois en allemand et en espagnol. Découvrez la vision d'acteurs audacieux et influents du changement, vers un monde éthique, solidaire, généreux et profondément respectueux de tous, des cultures, des peuples, des règnes et de la planète. Un incroyable panel de conférences, couvrant toutes les dimensions de l'éducation, pour un futur ayant du sens, une humanité épanouie et une terre qui respire. Une chose est sûre, votre vie, et à travers vous, celle des enfants, ne sera plus la même après avoir écouté toutes ces conférences. Pour avancer, nous avons besoin de vous. Nous avons besoin de votre générosité solidaire. L'organisation du sommet et l'édition des conférences ont nécessité des milliers d'heures de travail et nécessitent encore beaucoup de temps et d'investissement. Nous faisons appel aux dons libres et spontanés pour compléter le financement du sommet et, si possible, continuer à l'enrichir de nouvelles conférences. Votre soutien est vraiment précieux et vital pour aller jusqu'au bout de cette aventure extraordinaire. Merci. Donc, je suis très, très heureux d'accueillir Philippe Pérennes. So, I am very happy to welcome Philippe Pérennes. Pérennes, yes, Philippe Pérennes. It's of uh, Spanish origin. No, that's from Brittany. So, I am very happy to welcome Philippe. I haven't had the opportunity to meet him, but uh, he's working for at least uh, 40 years now at uh, a school, Renoval School, and uh, you learned uh, movement senses uh, through uh, dance, and um, you were a trainer? No, I am uh, a trainer in pedagogy for 30 years now. And uh, I am uh, very happy to have uh, someone uh, working in the Steiner schools uh, in order to share your um, experience about the future of education, for, to have a future that is uh, consistent with the essential values of uh, life that are more and more necessary. So you have the floor. And uh, I would like to thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity. I heard uh, the, the, the previous speaker and I will continue because I think uh, these uh, impulse and these projects are extraordinary. I asked to be, I'd, I asked to have a quote from uh, Antoine Saint-Exupéry, 
for the future, it's not about uh, uh, forecasting it, but it's uh, being able to create it. And uh, the previous speaker is not forcing the future, but thanks to the, the, the training he gives to the teenagers, he will enable them to understand the future and understand what's at stake. And it's a, a real honor to uh, speak uh, after him. So I will start uh, saying that I am a teacher in uh, Steiner schools, in one uh, Steiner school, the one of uh, Colmar. For years and years now, I began in 1982, so it's been 40 years I've been teaching continuously. And I have seen during these last 40 years a kind of evolution of the work we had to do as teachers. And I'd like to talk about this, these new trends, this evolution, because it is important to understand them if uh, we want to create a certain future. I am working with a, a circle of uh, pedagogists uh, with the 40 teachers from 40 uh, different nationalities. So we have uh, the opportunity to meet twice a year from all the continents and all the countries and to exchange about new trends that uh, we see in the world. And today I'm going to uh, explain the conclusion we reached with uh, these uh, colleagues from the previous, uh, and that, that, that these trends, I, the, the previous Philippe touched upon them. And when we want to educate children, there is something we have to keep in mind. It's that the time in which uh, children are living has uh, uh, requests. And uh, we need to understand these requests in order to give the children what they need uh, to create their future. And so, for two years now, the conditions in which children are raised have changed radically. One of my... Uh, English teacher, English colleague told me it's a kind of tsunami. When we look at the results of the two last years, we figure out that there is there are a lot of children that are in difficult situations for their development. When we think about the lockdown situations in Brazil or when we think about the, the Chinese children, we figure out that uh, there, there has been 3 billion, 3.5 billion people who were in very difficult situation during the lockdown. And this is linked to our time and we need to understand what does that mean for the inner and external development of the child in order to understand which orientation, which teaching orientations are essential today. And with my colleagues, we found three shortcomings for children. The first shortcoming is the perception, the direct sensorial perception. There has been 
a shift to um, from the perception, from the reality to the virtual world. And uh, this is happening everywhere in all countries because with the lockdown, we needed to create links and these links were created online. I am not criticizing this. Hopefully we had that, but it's not because I am uh, not criticizing this, that I am not raising awareness about the danger of these links because now we need to understand how we need to act. And the second shortcoming we uh, agreed on with my colleagues, it is clear that the children are lacking human meetings, human contacts. That's to say that they didn't reach their quota of um, meetings, they didn't have enough opportunities to meet other children and so sometimes they don't go naturally towards uh, uh, the others. Children don't want to see uh, their grandparents anymore because they just fear to, to contaminate them. And so this is very important. So the second shortcoming is the lack of uh, contacts, uh, human physical contacts. And the third one is uh, uh, significant. That's the lack of activity. And I would say the deficit, the lack of movement, and it's not only about uh, running or walking, it's moving uh, the feet, the hands, and with this we need to connect the world in a free way and through an activity will um, connect with, the na with nature. And Now, children are moving less and they are lacking something. So I don't insist on these uh, three points. These are characteristics of this civili civilization in which we uh, are and uh, uh, that have had an impact on our children. So we are seeing that uh, children are not meeting uh, as much people as they should. And when we see that, we need to focus on one thing. Each time we replaced uh, one essential activity by something else. And that is what will give us the impression that these different these uh, shortcomings are present. Speaking about the perception, the fact of uh, shifting from the real world into the very has a huge impact on the children's development. But the illusion is that, uh, yes, we see the world, we meet other people's true uh, screens, and we are moving, but no, that's not the same because when we focus on the senses, we understand a very important thing. And we should be able to change our conception of the sensorial perception. Why? Because in general, when we are speaking about the, 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 the senses perception, we say, okay, these are things that happen, but, but these are not so important. And this is a huge mistake because the studies are showing that as far as uh, the uh, sense perceptions are concerned, we should consider them as 
nutrition problems. Since sensitive nutrition should become a concept. Why? Because the same law applies apply to nutrition we need to eat we need to drink and to the, the senses so we can understand that from the beginning from at the, the, the stage of the embryo these are cells there are cells towards the uh, interior and uh, the exterior and the inner cells will create other cells related to the metabolism and uh, other things while the external cells will develop for the uh, senses and so we can see that uh, in the embryo we have both reality realities about uh, the senses and the body. And so what do you need to be uh, healthy? You need uh, quality ingredients. And when you have a good quality, you have a good uh, quantity and when uh, you look at the quantity, the quality, you have to look at the diversity. You need to change what you're eating. And when you have these three elements, there is a fourth one, the frequency. That's to say that you need to eat uh, regularly. So you need to eat well and regularly. But when we reflect about that, at the level of the senses, isn't it the same? That's to say that our vision of the world is a multiple one. We see, we hear, we smell, we taste, but we have also a sense for movement, for balance, and all these senses are collaborating in order to help us to develop uh, an awareness of the world surrounding us. We need to understand that when we are switching off our senses, what's happening, we can't see, we can't hear, we can't smell, we can't taste. When we switch off all the senses, we are all doing the same. And uh, we are falling asleep. We are losing consciousness. In order to sleep, you need to switch off your senses. And one of the most interesting things to check is to see how we do when we wake up. That's the reverse phenomenon happening. You wake up and you wake up one sense and then another. Some people are awake with their eyes, others with their ears, the others will smell the coffee and uh, etc. And waking up is means uh, taking means uh, uh, being aware of the world that's surrounding us. And so, a thing that is uh, very interesting to understand is that we need to focus on the multiple aspects of the senses. We can't uh, have only one ingredient. You need several ingredients, as many as possible. And this aspect of multiplicity is natural and it comes from two elements. First of all, nature. And so we'll uh, thank Philippe Nicolas for uh, his intervention. And secondly, the artistic world uh, bringing a certain consistency. 
because uh, you need to understand that what makes an in individual consistent what gives uh, an inner integrativity to an individual the fact that he has different perception understanding consistency for instance let's take an orange uh, the orange has a color a smell a taste a weight a texture that are all converging and all these elements are speaking to one of our senses. Uh, I knew a child who said, ah, it tastes like it smells. And so he was consistent with uh, all these uh, senses. Let's imagine you have an orange that is pink in polystyrene and smelling um, and uh, smelling like a banana. How would you explain that? So you have different senses uh, and they all need to converge on the same reality. And it's important to have this consistency. I will give you an example. I was uh, in uh, Freiburg, a really nice city in Germany, where there is a university, and it was late in the evening, 11 p.m., midnight, and I was walking in the city, and I saw people eating in a restaurant, and I saw on the wall a screen. And on this screen, there was a fire. And I was wondering, which is the converging activity that is happening if someone is looking to a fire on a screen? First of all, the sense of the vision is involved. Yes, but the colors are not the same. The color of the flame on the screen and uh, the color of the flame on uh, a real flame is different. There was no sound. So the ear doesn't, uh, isn't involved. The smell isn't involved either because there was no smell and the taste the taste the taste wasn't involved when you are near a, a fire you taste it and here you couldn't taste anything and could you could you feel the warmth no not at all and so i stopped there just to understand that this is an illusion of fire, but this illusion is not without consequence. Because the brain has this particularity, the brain is an organ that is working in a modular way and not centralized one. It means that uh, when the informations are, are coming, when the information is coming, um, they will explode in the head. And on um, each sense, uh, you have a part of the brain uh, that is uh, related and so, there are different uh, neuron connections. And so when you see a real fire, all the senses understand that there is a fire and it's a, a, a celebration in your brain. 
because all your senses are working all together and are creating something uh, true. But when you are looking at a screen, so you see a fire, so you use the sight, but not the other senses. It means that the person won't have the same uh, uh, inner consistency between the real world and the digital world. So I am not criticizing the digital world at all. And uh, I thank the uh, virtual world because it has allowed to create this summit. But from the point of view of uh, the nutrition, there is no diversity. So there's a very little diversity. We can show through the, the, the quantity because for, for children, we, we're sitting in front of a screen seven hours a day, which is quite long. But each time, each time there is something which is not in order from a sensorial uh, uh, diet, because you can become a, a, a bulimia uh, of your senses. There are some that remain inside when they when they're not corresponding to the age, you can have an indigestion of senses. You can be put off in a famine of your senses in the 70s. We opened to the orphanages. You remember in what happened in Romania, where the children were sitting on a bed and they, they had to drink, they had to eat, we gave them to survive, but they didn't have any games, no adults taking care of them. What did we notice? Uh, that uh, there was an enormous uh, delay in these children. They had a very a development of the brain that was much smaller because they had no, they'd never seen fireworks of fire. They were in a situation where they were deprived of the sense that they, they couldn't develop them. They couldn't develop them. And so they were running late as far as matricity is concerned. So, and so on and so on. So it's not without consequences. And I would like, in the same way that we organize events uh, for eating bio, also to have these, uh, uh, th th this experiment, because this perception, because the natural perception is what enables the individual to see his own individual coherence and it's as from there that he's going or she's going to write her biography. It's what he's going to feel inside of himself, those children that went to see volcanoes who went to and fro. This little girl, they've lived through something which is so strong. It transformed us. Of course it transformed them. And um, there is a guy who is very interesting, Mr. Schmidt. Robin Schmidt is Swiss and is involved in uh, sociology and education. And he's talking to us today about something, what she's calling the new transcendence. What is this, this new transcendence? Um, well, there's also the, the old one. Where the fact that uh, the children uh, here in the 50s, 60s, the 70s, up to 75, 80, what was the problem then? The problem was that they were anchored in natural life and the problem is the transcendence. It was to make them feel that there was another life, another form of spirituality. We, they were educated towards something, but Mr. Schmidt is talking to the new transcendence. And what is this new transcendence? This new transcendence is the fact that 
the children have migrated from the sensorial perception. They went to the virtual world and, and now we have to make them descend on earth again to make them come back to the planet, to their environment in such a way that they really can become earth inhabitants that they have these terrestrial experiments. So the new transcendence is to make them come down again. And that is a very well expressed. So, so, so you see, this is the point of view of sensorial perception, but also of the migration of sensorial perceptions in the virtual world. And then immediately, that is the work what ought to be done with children today. Whatever the school is where you find yourself, you don't even need to be in a school in order to feel this. And this, what we have to do is that, see to it that the children, the small children, can perceive the world of reality, the real environment that they can see what is uh, done when there's a fire, what is uh, going on on the earth, uh, to looking at all these elements and that they can build up their own inner uh, coherence, starting with the coherence of the world. And uh, it's a perception of the earth uh, that is leading us to our perception. I'm just I uh, leave this aside for a moment and I'm coming to the second uh, yes no, no I would like to add something first this impulsion of seeing to it that the children are being put in situations of direct uh, perception it's it's uh, looked upon by a lot of pedagogical advisors and they set up a new pedagogical impulses that see to it that the children are in contact with the natural environment. We have schools without schools, meaning without any classrooms, uh, schools where everything is happening outside. So, 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 so all the classes are giving outside in countries such as Israel, we have people, okay, once uh, a child comes to school one day per week he has to be outside at least and go for a walk and we take them here and there and then there's an entire program from the age of seven up to the, the age of 14 where this is progressively intensified through physical uh, uh, activity the, the activity of going to uh, to the outside uh, to, to, to the, the outside world to and uh, after all the, the, the nature is the only architect uh, of what is happening so there's a lot of impulses that are given and when we have our children or our grandchildren we should take 10 minutes uh, and what is nicer than go and play outside or to, to going to sit on the lawn to look at a tree or all this, just going out with them. This is the first thing. And I would like to take a second and a third example. Secondly, briefly, it's a second deficit, uh, which are the human meetings. The fact that our children have been deprived from meeting other humans, um, not entirely deprived, but it was strongly reduced. So what does this mean for a young child of only seeing people through a screen or only seeing the members of his family, or only seeing people who are living in his neighborhood once a, uh, once a day, or when you're authorized to do so. What does it mean? There's one thing we have to be aware of, and uh, 
we've been doing this for quite some time now. The human being is not being built simply taking his own forces and himself, but we are in a period, in a near, what uh, we built, we built by those surrounding us. So that's another reality as a human being. We uh, meet, we're meeting this in the um, view other people have uh, from us, through the other people. We also see this uh, through uh, the, th the thoughts of other people. So when there is a presence, and here I insist on this, when there's direct presence of uh, people to people, there's something lighting up, but such as uh, the natural coherence of nature. The human being has an internal coherence. It is something which is really fundamental today, being able to, to face, to see one another, to be able to meet them directly. This is the first factor of the discovery of what? Of his own humanity. His own humanity, in other words, the children, they become more human through meeting other humans. If you want to educate them socially, it's the element of meeting other people that are essential and not giving them the illusion of a meeting we have through the social networks, which they can only lightens up only parts of their brain. And uh, I'm being reassured by my pupils because they're not uh, stupid. They use this as anyone else. And uh, the young people, they understood everything. But in any case, my humanity depends from my capability of understanding the humanity of the others. It's so nice uh, thinking that I'm waking up. I'm woken up by the others. I have everything to learn from my pupils also, and they're being raised by my own humanity. We help one another to, in this particular field, there's no hierarchy. There are no little ones. There are not higher ones or so lower ones. As soon as you go to the domain of humanity, of meetings of the individual, we are all the same. We are all equal. Have the same reality. So you see, the fact that we that we deprive them from the perception of someone else, and also the fact of not having the right to, to meet someone else in France. For those who are listening, as uh, uh, from another country, when a child who goes to a clinic, you're not entitled to go and see him. So it's very important to uh, the first hours of a newly born, we're not entitled to go and see him. And you should know that there are some children that have never seen the face of a human being, of another human being, uh, because the other person was wearing a mask. They never saw his entire face. Um, and now everything is, re something is revealed to him before it was hidden. And so here we are facing a deficit, which in reality is uh, giving rise uh, to anxiety to individuals. Because once uh, you, or when you do not pay, you cannot uh, become acquainted to, and, and when you're seven, when you're five, it's not only uh, meeting other people, but it's also knowing yourself. Um, and um, now, sometimes it's only done partially, or not at all, because you have these social networks. Well, this deficit is such that uh, 
the, 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 the Jewel is quite uh, is, is scared of the others and himself. So when we come to feel uh, with, uh, with children this lack, uh, this deficit uh, of the truth, the veracity of meeting others, and to be really with the other person. We know that in the same way, we're going to try by all possible means to take them outside, to take them to, the, to nature, to bring them where they have little knowledge of. So we're going to promote the real meeting. Let me give you an example. Last year, we had a new lockdown, as a lot of people, so we have a class with 30 pupils. And um, they were so well, always on the phone. Uh, and um, they also uh, all worked on their own account. It was something uh, open for them. And in about one month and a month and a half of lockdown, then we came back to school. And they no longer wanted to continue their work. So they were there, uh, seated next to one another. And all the work that had been done with a lot of enthusiasm when they came back to school, there was nothing. They didn't want to meet the other or to do something together. And the, 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 the teacher, who was responsible for that project with them, uh, took them by the hand uh, with a lot of pedagogy. We took one, two, made them work together, then once again, one, two, three, working together. We, then we put four, six together until we were all once again together. And uh, there we've noticed what was happening when uh, uh, through a particular uh, artistic uh, movement, we brought the children to me to, at, the, at the arts or the artistic level. Progressively, they took up work and when it was shown to adults, uh, it was uh, as if something was blossoming. And one of them, one of them, 13 years old, expressed the following. Said, telling us we are no longer the same, full stop. We're no longer the same. In other words, through the meeting, because when you have the art of moving, you cannot do just anything. You, you have to take care of the others and also being in the perception of the entire movement in order to integrate this in a coherent manner. And that is the purpose of art, do also in presence of the others. And they uh, succeeded thanks to the guidance of the teacher of doing so. And the, the, the conclusion is that uh, they met, they met uh, at a different level than the one where they normally uh, or ordinarily met. Uh, and even up to inside themselves, they are no longer the same. The others change us and we change the others. So through them, we saw uh, really uh, uh, things, new things. Some killer were quite nervous, were belligerent, and here they were put in a position of helping the others. New games uh, uh, were shown or started to exist. All of a sudden, they needed to meet around the bowl, and there were some things that uh, afterwards uh, flourish. You just have to put your uh, your foot in the stirrups, and then it was a real meeting. And the characteristic of a real meeting is, after all, the presence of the human being in with together with the human being. We have to be there for the others, and the others have to be there for you, for us. And when we succeed in seeing to it, 
that we have this particular configuration, then we feel that we've done something for the future. So all these impulses, uh, uh, when it is theater, which on a boat, which it's a circus a spectacle, on a, a play in theater, a poetic evening, an orchestra, a uh, choral, all the things which will be done with this presence, and uh, this will densify, this is something we could be blessed with. Um, now I'm going to take the last point, uh, which is the one of movement. Earlier on we mentioned uh, that we had been deprived or uh, deprived from our freedom. We couldn't go where we wanted to go. We couldn't do whatever we wanted to, to do. The only thing is that there were some essential activities we could carry out in it, as opposed to the non-essential ones. And there, on that side, as an adult, we could cope with it, but the children, the children, that's a different matter, a different story. And uh, they have a particular talent. And in order to do so, I'm going to tell you a short story that happened to me, just to make you feel what are we really talking about when you say, okay, after one year, they didn't move, it's not so, oh, it's not that bad, and now they can move again, etc., etc. No, 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 no. Let me tell you the following story. So I left on a holiday with my wife, and we were going to Brittany with an old car, and behind which we were dragging on a caravan. And uh, there were a lot of people behind us uh, who were cursing us because 200 kilometers between Colmar and Brittany at a very reduced speed. So we upset half of France. So the fact is that uh, uh, it was about 12 noon. I uh, was driving at 60 kilometers an hour with my caravan. And all of a sudden there was a, uh, a post uh, uh, in front of me, uh, 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 a, uh, a sign uh, plate, uh, cognac, and I didn't know where to go to. Do I have to go straight on or turn left or right or whatever? So all of a sudden, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a choice. I woke up my wife. I said, where are we going? She opens up her eyes. She saw uh, the panel cognac, and she says, no, pa a cognac, not to cognac. The message was quite clear. Not to cognac. So I came to the crossroads, and I don't know why. I'm turning right, and uh, I'm going in the direction of cognac. So I understood what uh, uh, she was talking about, not to cognac, but my arms had decided something different. It's quite odd, but that's the way it is. I had understood we have to go straight on, and I turned right. And happily enough, 50 meters, there was another crossroads, and I could come back. I could turn back. But one thing, when I take the uh, road, I lost about what? One minute? 45 seconds? Mo almost. But when I arrived, just behind a monstrous, enormous accident, two cars, 90 kilometers an hour, a frontal accident, and the car, what was left of this was about uh, uh, one, one and a half meters. So I could avoid, I avoided an accident. I'm not going to tell you all the details, but in the evening, it, when you start to think of your life and what you, when you do some retrospection, you come back, you have a, uh, you, to, to, to look at the existence. So, so the, the, the existence, uh, you go back to the, the, the past on your, 
And then, when you think of it, you said, well, my God, what would have happened if I didn't go to Cognac? Question. And when you notice these kind of things several times in your life, people you meet in unbelievable situations, then you ask yourself the question, the human being doesn't, it doesn't uh, the human being have a double intelligence, the cerebral, the brain capacity we have, we can develop it too. But the other intelligence, other than the brain intelligence, the intelligence of your legs, the intelligence of your arms, of your hands, this intelligence we say such that our food takes us to meet another person at a certain time, that our arms doing something, that kind of a gesture at such a time, which will wake up something. Look at the people in your lives, which are important, the important people you met. How did you meet them? And here we are aware, we become aware of something, that there are laws we can only see res retroactively when doing uh, retrospection. But also we have a meeting with the future. So this intelligence, uh, I succeeded in feel it, in anticipating the intelligence of the hands, the arms and the feet and the legs. And all this can bring us, can take us with a certainty to the proper place at the proper moment, provided that we let them do what they had to do. And letting them do is not to deprive them of freedom. So, for your employment of time from eight hours in the morning till 10 o'clock in the evening, the, the, uh, going and knowing where you're going to go, they don't have a lot of freedom to take you left or right or, or back. But whenever you have 10 minutes where you don't do anything, do you have these 10 minutes? So, uh, I'm going to tell you another story. Just to illustrate all this, we were looking for a particular teacher uh, in the school. We, we didn't find him. And so I received a phone call from an, uh, an ancient student who was maniacal, depressive. Uh, and uh, she went through our region and uh, uh, she asked whether she could meet us. I said, yes. And so we met in the Cathedral of Colmar. And uh, normally I'm always in advance uh, because it is something I like. I like to be coming uh, early. So I came uh, 50 minutes early and I had nothing to do. These are situations which are great. You don't have anything to do. And next to the Cathedral of Colmar, what do you do? You go round to the Cathedral. So I uh, went round the Cathedral. And at the corner of the street, I'm meeting a, an ancient uh, parent of, a, of a, a pupil. And each time, because what we're interested in, of course, are, and what they're interested in, the parents are, the children, which for some time were all children as teachers. So I said what became of her fourth year of medicine, uh, likes it a lot, etc., etc. And in the, during the discussion, she said, but you teachers of Altdorf, you're happy teachers. I stopped her, I said, what do you mean we are happy teachers? I, I like them that they tell me why. Why? And she told me, why? Just imagine, because my niece, who is a professor, a teacher of biology, she unhappy where she is, and she's looking for a school. So here, make the link. So for months you've been looking for a biology teacher, and which you can't find. And it doesn't mean all the normal means don't work. And here, 
you meet, uh, you're meeting up with a pupil, so you're following, or you're coming across that person, the parent of a pupil, and you really have what you're looking for, I can assure you. I can you multiply the examples by 10, by 20, by 30 in my biography or in the biography of other people. So I'm convinced, I'm convinced that in your biography you will find similar things. It's the proof of an intelligence which is not, uh, not in the emergence of your brain, but that lives in the hands, the feet, etc. And once you feet, those hands have the possibility of being free. When are they free? When to, you don't force them to do something. That's a different situation. Either you're on holiday, either you're coming, you're arriving somewhere quite in advance, and then you have some time to do so, to do something else, or you're involved in arts activities. And here, the particularity is you're doing something that doesn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, then you have to do something which no one ever did before. So whether you paint, painting, sculpture, or whatever, the intelligence of the hands is being revealed through the activity, this artistic activity. So in the freedom of movement, uh, you have the possibility for the human being to meet the, 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 the creative part that is inside uh, of you. So having trust in the capacity to create something that doesn't exist. So for concerning the future, we shouldn't foresee it, but you should make it possible, making it possible a creative activity that's what the world needs today making possible making it possible that the future can take place through different activities well this the small the very small child well not all that small four years old three years old three four five six seven years old there is an activity which for him or her is fundamental in uh, during his day, it's what we call free games in the Steiner schools. So when the children, or when you make available a lot of things, uh, stones, uh, fabrics, uh, uh, anything you might think of, uh, and he can now take whatever he wants in order to do what he wants. Of course, within the the, the framework of a uh, you know, safe environment. So you will become aware very rapidly that the real intelligence of uh, is uh, precisely in this activity. That's where to going to transform a table into an elephant. Everything will be transformed. Everything will happen there. So you will have a lot of things uh, and you'll have an intelligence, a remarkable intelligence. And in the same way, a baby, a baby, when it's small, and then when you look and, and you see his legs going over and to, coming to and fro, moving them, but what is he doing? Is, having, is he having fun? No, he is working. A child uh, will never, uh, never works that hard only then when he's given the opportunity to do so when he has some free time the movement of the hands of the, the, the of the feet help him to educate his ocular muscles and then he can use it actively this intelligence we are not aware of it because we are so used to it and we're not aware that there's no human being which is an imbecile it doesn't exist who takes a piece of uh, a piece of bread uh, and eats it and it digests it? it is, it's an intelligence. It is the intelligence which is absolutely phenomenal. So now you see the smaller ones when you let them go to a recreation park, when they're skating, riding their bicycle, going to their grandparents. Well, but. Uh, you can also go where the intelligence takes them.
to do on the right right time, right place. So this particular intelligence should be expressed. But just imagine for a while, there is for the sports uh, people, but don't fear, it will happen. For us uh, ordinary beings, Google shoes, what are these? Google shoes, when you put them on, they have a GPS. You can program them. And you can put it up uh, earphones. Uh, and when you, you put them on, when you're walking your kid to the grandparents, uh, so and uh, you will hear go straight on 20 meters up to there, then turn left. So it's the counter image of something, of something important. You replace the intelligence. I call it the cosmic intelligence, because I believe it's in relation with all, all the other human beings. Uh, its intelligence will be replaced by an artificial intelligence, an intelligence which is between the cosmos and the individual person. And here it will get used to follow indications which are not his or hers, because the individual will be telling not to cognac in you. Nevertheless, go to cognac. You follow an intelligence which is his. So here, through the movement, you can see to it that uh, the individual is linking to future impulses in him. It's not only to move, it's not only to run the 100 meters, but it's now it's linking up to this causality that comes from the other side and that was uh, described in a book by Philippe Guimard. So it's the other causality. Well, he needs it. Why? Why? Because it's the one of the future. It's the one that is living in the metabolism. And to look how the things are. You take the cells of a, of a nerve. What is in it? DNA. What is DNA? It's the genetic heritage written in crypt encrypted uh, and which we inherit. Uh, it's in the, the, the nerve, it's in this intelligence. If you take blood, if you take a, a red blood cell, if you look inside, what do you find in there? You don't find a DNA. Why? Because there's some things which are already encrypted in uh, the human being, the, the, what you inherited, but there's something else. This Counterintelligent, which is expressed in the free movement and which is not yet written yet uh, by the DNA in the, 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 the red blood cells. And here you come to understand something else. The more you enhance the freedom of movement, either because the child is totally free or because it's entering an arts or artistic activity, the more you highlight what in him is the future. That's the purpose of education, is seeing to it that the child gets loose of his inheritance, that he doesn't become his, uh, his mother or his father, that he becomes himself. So the, the, the depriving someone of movement uh, is something quite serious in the development of a child. So we, when we can take a child and bring it into situations as I described before, well then, we contribute strongly to the fact that is going to link up with this future element through movement. And as you saw, how the children are enthusiastic. Uh, you saw how they felt, how they run. The movement generated this uh, momentum towards the future. Because if you move, it's going, you want to go somewhere. You, you need an inspiration to the future in order to, 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 to move. If you don't move, you become depressive. If a future calls you, you stand up. Yesterday, um, the, 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 I counted those who were absent. Uh, and uh, it's like uh, I, 
also elaborated the play with the class uh, between September and April. What happened? So in September, October, November, we had 10% of absentees uh, between 10 and 12%. And uh, here, uh, three months before the play, we only have 2%. 0% one month before, up to the play itself, and uh, they worked enormously. Eight uh, consecutive uh, performances. So they were drawn by this will, by this envy, the, 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 this want to be in the play. So they were no longer, were no longer absent. So that's what I noticed with my own eyes. So I've been talking now for one hour, that's enough. So let me summarize the situation by saying that, uh, that in our period, we have a particular uh, challenge, uh, the sensorial, sometimes uh, I stake it to a virtual world, uh, but uh, in this way, our senses are being fragilized. And um, we are putting a break uh, on children's uh, imagination, but we have a duty as pedagogical advisor. It's uh, readable through. We have to, or we have to relate the people to the natural world, to the world, the artistic world. Also, putting the children in relation with one another. And, uh, not only with the, what is in their neighborhood, in, the, in their environment, but with the entire world, to authorize them. The fact not being programmed from morning to evening, the children ought to play, they ought to start uh, uh, with this. So that's what I wanted to say. And uh, for me, I could say, you know, as far as the future is concerned, it is not to foresee it, but to make it possible. Let us make the future possible through these impulses, through our presence with the children. So that's what I wanted to tell you. So thank you for having invited me, because I really had to get it off my heart. I see it, Philip, that you really love this. So I see uh, that you take this at heart. Yes, of, of course. But uh, when you're with children the whole day, uh, and uh, it breaks your heart uh, to see them, uh, how they came out of the lockdown, their fears, uh, from when you see all this, uh, it hurts. Uh, and uh, so uh, we have to act. But uh, the remarks that we make, where all this was seen at the world level. It's not only me observing it, everyone noticed it. So thank you, Philip, for sharing all this with uh, you. So there are no comments. Well, um, yes, yesterday I talked about, because yesterday I uh, also talked about the intelligence. Uh, so I talked about uh, the, the, this intelligence as well. And uh, and different uh, keynote speakers also mentioned this. Uh, and uh, the movement, nature, and all that. So. Yes, we're connected to the same realities, of course. So. Okay, I don't see any questions, uh, nor any comments. Uh, if perhaps I could, uh, well, take advantage of the time that is remaining. Yes, of course, go, still have some time until uh, six o'clock. Uh, so, yes, because I didn't want to make it too long because after 45 minutes, our uh, tension is sl uh, s slowing down. Yes, so. You remember the example of the orange uh, the, 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 that has a color, a texture, a taste, uh, and also the, 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 the fire, real fire, etc. I tried to show 
in that the convergence of perceptions are such that there's a conversion of individual force within the child. There's something that is being put together because it's together. It's uh, as if we had, uh, let's say, uh, a fashion designer within us, and someone is standing in the middle, and he, each time he can relate uh, to the others, uh, building up himself, and when he can't, uh, then... But what is essential in a human being is, uh, is uh, individuality, but then there's another coherence. And that coherence, uh, I'm thinking of it uh, because there's not only the schools doing so, there are, the, 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 there are um, sometimes uh, you have very long queues before you get out of there, before you can leave the, the town. There's some children also living in lockdown the entire year because uh, they, 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 they can't go out living in huge apartment buildings. It's the counter image of what was given. But what do we do for them? What do we do for these children who are locked up, so to speak? Well, here we have to become aware of one thing. An artist, whatever his art might be, it's the one who is capable of putting together what is not naturally put together. He's going to make particular associations uh, which are his, and which are his individual brand. From a musical point of view, if you just take any Rachmaninoff, uh, Chopin, and once you've recognized these elements, you recognize his music, his writings, his style, it's something quite particular. Giacometti, for instance, the sculpture of, of Giacometti, you can be mistaken. And so we become aware that the artist has this faculty of uh, saying this and that, that is an image, it's this movement, I'm going to put them together, I'm going to make a combination and it will shape something which is coherent uh, from an artistic point of view. And when you really meet uh, a work of art, I'm not going to uh, tell you a story because I met a work of art. It's not easy, eh? it's not easy. It's like meeting someone, you have to be prepared. Uh, it's not just happens, doesn't happen like that. It's as if, uh, it's not because you're in front of a painting. You need a, so, a certain inner opening. So I took a great passion for a long time for the work of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, it fascinated me. So I, I took the decision one day to go and see the scene in Milano. And this scene by Leonardo da Vinci has now been uh, restored a couple of years ago. And we just have the colors of Leonardo, which he put uh, down which he added millimeter after millimeter was something extraordinary. So we now have the original. And all the rest uh, was uh, uh, um, taken away. And, but at that time, we were entitled uh, to the day. Uh, in those days, I still had the time to stay. Now you only have 20. Uh, minutes, if you wanted to, to stay two hours in front of a painting, you could, but now you only have 20 minutes. But so, whenever you go in front of a work of art, so we have a curious feeling. First, uh, the one of being left. I'm talking about myself. You being lost in front of a thing. There are enormous uh, details, left, right, on top, below, everywhere. And then, progressively, you enter inside the thing, and what appears then are relationships between the things. And you see that there are some uh, people who look to one side, other people to look to the other side. 
some people who listen and who become aware in this scene and that gave me a, a, a hair I noticed that the senses of the human being were representing it was one of uh, so when you leave you have St. Thomas uh, and you can go around you can uh, uh, have a look at the other apostles. Uh, each and every one is in relation with a particular sense. And there, when you see this, so perhaps uh, you've been in front of the painting for one hour, you don't move, and you're starting to live in this dimension, and you become aware that there is something that comes towards you. Something that uh, comes right to you so meeting a work of art, it can only be a meeting with yourself. The artist is the one to the painting, the sculpture, his music uh, is capable, so through the coherences is putting on the painting to meet you, to meet with yourself. And this brought me to work uh, for 20, 25 years on the senses. So it is something. So the, 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 uh, I'm going to say it in a different way. The real art can only be made if you don't know what you're going to produce whilst doing it. It cannot be a projection of your mental. No, you have an apple, then you paint an apple. No, that's a photo. So the motives, the things we talked about previously, these uh, uh, things crop up when you're doing them progressively. So someone wrote this, it was very concentrated. You know it, uh, perhaps it's magnificent, it's Christian Robin. He writes, uh, uh, in a magnificent way, very profound, creating resonance with his readers. And that's what he says, just to show what it's all about. He says, in a book called A Loge of the Young, honoring nothing. So I had to um, give a conference in the evening and uh, I found on uh, my night table a little book. I opened it just like that and I find a sentence which I'm going to read. Once again, this intelligence of the hands uh, brings you uh, and takes you to your night table to the good page, the proper page. So, as if uh, it was keeping it's leading you to something written which is available day and night. It's the opposite, which is true. You can, of course, only write what you ignore. You can only write when you go to the unknown, not to recognize it, but to love it. I can read it again if you want to. So we're asking too much from the writers, as if they uh, had an um, abundant knowledge, as if you were writing fr from this know-how. No, it's the other way around. You can only write what you ignore when going towards the unknown and not in order to know it, but to love it. Uh, so this is uh, the, an ideal thing. And, uh, so this is very important, so to discover yourself, so it's a key uh, moment, it's everything to do with the activities in nature, also that the human being in, a, uh, in, a, in an environment which is not always uh, positive. So to see to it, you have this link with this creativity which he has in himself. 
magnificent. Qui, qui va dans ce sens-là, qui, qui est magnifique, mais bon, ce n'est pas le moment. Mais... I would have a story to tell you, but uh, maybe it's not the moment. Oh, well, yeah, okay, I will tell it to you. So, you know, I like to sing, and my first song came so, and I was playing guitar, the guitar, and in 10 minutes, I created a song, and I was... I was young, and with the training I had, I, uh, I, I said, okay, well, this song is not the best one, but in 10 minutes I made a song. I was living in the, the Beaujolais, and uh, I was uh, getting up at seven. My mother was supposed to come. I was uh, in, in, in the campaign, and... At the end of the street, someone was waiting for me, and I knew this person uh, because I went with this person in the primary school, and he said, okay, I'm going to, to bring you to your guide. And so we went through the, the, the collins, and then we arrived near to a bridge, and on the other side of the bridge, there was a man with a long white hairs, I had my guitar, and this man asked me, sing a song. And I said, no, no, but this, this song is really crap. But I will play another song. And I learned another song uh, that I learned three weeks before. And then I woke up. But I, I was dreaming, and I was... I was sure I wasn't dreaming, but in fact, I was in my bed and I was dreaming. And I said, oh, I should have played my song. And then I took my guitar, I played my song, and I was so moved that I cried during two hours. And I understood the difference, uh, this story. I, I understood the message. The message is you shouldn't judge... Uh, what you are creating because it's not you uh, who's, uh, who um, is uh, creating the song. And that was a surprising dream. But I directly understood the message. Don't judge what you create because that's not you who's creating uh, the products, but uh, your inner intelligence. Yeah, that's a nice story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. And uh, if you had a guitar, uh, I would uh, ask you to play a song. That's a really personal song. Do we understand that in the Steiner schools, we work with our hands. When the children are at school, They learn to draw, they learn everything. But uh, in reality, we add the colors uh, and they are doing uh, the painting. We gave them pens and paint and they are doing everything. They learn to play music, they learn to play flute and they are really busy up to 14 years old they have uh, a lot of activities uh, movement activities they are singing they are painting they are drawing they are sculpting and so they are doing a lot of, of uh, things going out being outside they are doing a lot of gardening During uh, the, for, for two days now, we received hives, beehives in uh, our schools, and 
what is surprising is to see, okay, this inner intelligence that we have, we shouldn't lose it because if uh, the intelligence is not um, trained at a certain time, it will it will die, and uh, the child won't be 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 able to continue to understand this intelligence. And so you need to take care of this inner intelligence. Uh, and we are taking care of their intelligence up to 18 years. But I figure out one thing. We can wonder, okay, but while they are painting, drawing, sculpting, singing, uh, playing music, they are not doing it. They are not doing other things. There are plenty of things that they don't do, such as mathematics, French, geometry, etc. And so we could uh, we could uh, nourish uh, fears and concerns about that. So that's the contrary of what uh, we think. We are going against rationality. These children that have studied less than the other are gifted for mathematics, for French. In our school, we have a hundred percent success at the back and uh, we've been existing for 40 years we've never had a pupil failing at the back. The question is uh, to know why. But I'm telling this not to, to make advertisement on the Steiner schools because there are other alternative schools and uh, I respect the teachers from the public schools, but I just want to say that because there is a way to educate children Thanks to another intelligence, we uh, figured out that uh, uh, a child that uh, could do knitting um, was very precise and didn't lose uh, the, the threads, and so they have the capacity to follow uh, uh, logical reasoning. And so we see that when we don't overload the cerebral intelligence of children, but if we look uh, through the uh, artistical activity to develop the intelligence of the hands, of the feet, that's uh, this intelligence that will uh, awake the other intelligence, so the intellectual one. And these are things that are absolutely incredible. I could give you an example from the practice. I have seen many pupils, my oldest pupils have uh, more than 50 years now. And so I teach a lot of children. And I am thinking to one in particular, he was... Uh, full of goodwill, he wanted to do everything and uh, he was not very gifted intellectually, but uh, he was so sweet and so nice and he was knitting and working on mathematics and uh, he was always failing. And one day he arrived and said, okay, now I understand. And development is not a linear process. These are, there are different steps. And one day he told me, now I have understand. I understood mathematics. And yes, he understood the uh, mathematics, but then he was among the best of the class. And uh, he, he was scoring uh, very, very uh, well because he has always worked with his hands, his feet in the artistic domain. And 
we have this intelligence um, in our hands, in our with our feet, and so it's not about thinking and doing. It's trusting in our skills, our uh, creativity, our capacities through our gestures. And when you have this trust, then you don't have to worry. Your uh, other intelligence will be awakened. And I've seen that so many times that I can say that this is, uh, this is happening. Thank you. I am acting and learning at the same time. And I am learning because I am acting. And that's because I am acting that I am doing the impossible. I am acting, but in a certain way. I am not acting in a chaotic way. I am acting in a, a certain way according to my inner intelligence my natural intelligence. And on the other side, you have the pedagogical intelligence. That's to say what can be useful in order to develop certain activities. And so when the children are oriented in this domain, um, when children are given the tools, then they will awake their other intelligence. And what's a pity is that we are focusing too much on the uh, cerebral intelligence. Now, the children from uh, three years old on, now, uh, from three years old on, will need to learn and they will play less. And I am really concerned about that because they will play less. Yeah, we have uh, one minute left. Uh, Michel was saying, is, the, is your intelligence extra neuronal um, intelligence? Well, never heard of about that, but uh, I am interested in the manifestation of this intelligence, no matter what the name uh, you give to this intelligence. But um, now the individual has a new skill that he hasn't before, and that can be observed. Okay, and Aurore said also, children have uh, this intelligence naturally. How can you explain that? Are you making them aware of uh, all this? They need to trust this intelligence, yes. And thanks to this trust, they will develop uh, the, the conscience of uh, the intelligence. That's something they will base on their experience. But for that, they need to trust. A child who trusts his intelligence will develop uh, um, a consciousness of uh, him or herself. An awareness of uh, this intelligence. Thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to, 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 to share my vision. And uh, yes, we will continue uh, until uh, Saturday. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my vision and uh, for this uh, exchange. I don't know who were the participants, but uh, if uh, uh, I could bring uh, something to you, uh, then my goal is reached. Uh, thank you for listening to me and thank you for uh, sharing these uh, moments. If you want to uh, contact me, don't hesitate to do that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, and I wish you all the best.